Thanks everybody for coming to the Center for Robotics and Biosystems seminar. Uh, I am, we, as you know, we're doing a sort of a hybrid visit. Uh, Alison Okamura is joining us uh, at a distance, but many of us will have a chance to meet with her later uh, back in the conference room upstairs or individually by Zoom. So uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Alison Okamura from Stanford University. I've known Allison for a long time, uh, I think since uh, we were both grad students and uh, I went to visit Stanford and I discovered this hockey, ice hockey playing graduate student doing really <laughs> cool stuff. Um, and uh, of course she's gone on to do fantastic things since. Uh, most recently, Allison and I worked together a lot when she was editor in chief of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Letters that many of you know very well under her leadership. Uh, it's grown tremendously over the last several years and is probably the leading publisher of robotics papers in our society today. Um, Allison has lots of, uh, uh, lots of awards and other things to her name. I'll just name a few. First of all, she's the general chair or co-general chair of the upcoming IROS uh, 2022 conference when hopefully we'll finally be back together in person. She's the deputy director of the Wu Tsai Stanford Neurosciences Institute. She's the recipient of the 2020 IEEE Engineering and Medicine and Biology Technology or Technological Achievement Award, or so Technical Achievement Award, sorry. She's a 2019 Distinguished Service Award winner from the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society. Uh, she's an IEEE fellow, and she does a lot of fantastic and interesting works on haptics, soft robotics, medical robotics, teleoperation, education, and other areas. And so it's my real pleasure to uh, welcome Allison today. So please join me in welcoming her. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much for the lovely introduction, Kevin. Yeah, I remember the first time I met Kevin in person, he was visiting Stanford and he had actually done a, a, some postdoc time in Japan. And I remember picking your brain about what that would be like because I'd then, you know, had the opportunity to also uh, be a visiting student in Japan. and actually encourage all the students, if you have time, maybe the advisors will be cringing a bit, but if you have time in your program uh, to take such an opportunity to, uh, to visit and do research in, in other places. That was definitely a formative experience in my, in my graduate career. Um, so uh, I've got my slides shared now. Hopefully everyone can see them. Definitely give me a yell if anything seems wrong. Uh, so I, I love Northwestern, I love the robotics program, love the people that are there, and uh, very sad that I um, can't be there in person, but I'm glad many of you are in person, and also thanks to those of you online, uh, so I can get the chance to tell you about our latest work. And I was also thinking, I think the last time I was there was probably for the World Haptics Conference in 2015. So I'm sure there have been lots of changes in, in people since then, and I uh, yeah, hope to come and visit in person soon. So uh, for today's talk, I was uh, struggling a little bit to decide which, which topic to cover. Uh, I have a lot of students working on, on different things, but I decided uh, given the, the strength and, and history of, of haptics at Northwestern, I would focus my talk on haptics. And in particular things that my lab has been focusing on over the past uh, few years, uh, trying to move away from more traditional desktop haptic devices towards wearable devices. And in particular, how do these devices um, get used for communicating different types of information? So uh, somewhat unusually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with recognizing the students uh, who uh, did this work, um, both current and, and past students. Uh, all of these folks have just been amazing to work with. Many of them now have great positions in, in academia and in industry or on the postdoc route. And of course, none of this work could be done without them. So digging in, uh, I would say that the theme of my talk is how do you provide physical connections between different entities, especially in a wearable fashion. So uh, whether it's human-human, which especially might be in terms of social interactions or humans and autonomous agents, such as uh, someone giving you something, something, an agent giving you driving directions, uh, or human-robot interaction. As, as robots become more ubiquitous in our homes and in our environments, 
uh, what are the most seamless ways and natural ways of, of communicating with them. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna make a big argument to this audience about haptics versus vision versus sound. All of these different modalities of course are appropriate, uh, but haptics due to the, the need for, for power input and uh, some of the challenges of interfacing with, with moving, living, uh, unpredictable people make, make haptics a particularly interesting technology challenge. So we'd like to provide these physical connections. Um, and although I'm, yeah, again, I said I wasn't going to make a big argument for touch versus other sensory modalities, but I do think it is useful to especially compare touch versus sight, uh, given that most of the interfaces around us are through sight, so that we can begin to think about when is it appropriate to use touch versus vision. Uh, so I'll just touch on a few of these sort of dual properties of sight and touch. And I should say that these also highlight what are some of the challenges in creating touch interfaces that, that uh, might be different from visual interfaces. So with sight, we have you know, fairly centralized sensors, right? Two eyes right here, whereas touch is distributed all over our bodies. So this does mean that with touch, we have the opportunity to uh, provide a stimulus in different locations, uh, but it also means that sort of completely controlling touch sensation is nearly impossible, right? Uh, there's there's going to be places on the on the skin that we can't naturally reach. Um, another duality is that sight is is very broad, right? I can look with my eyes and and see my whole screen through the video. I can see the whole room of people sitting there. Uh, whereas touch, I think of as a more narrow form of interaction, right? If I were to uh, touch you rather than just see you, uh, whether it's me flying all the way to, to uh, Chicago and driving up, uh, or if I actually was in the room, I would still have to physically walk across the room in order to have this, this narrow physical interaction in order to make contact. And so all of these things make touch in some ways more challenging than sight, but it also means that there's this duality and we can figure out what are the ways in which sight and touch are most appropriately used, um, either in combination or one instead of the other, depending on the scenario. So it's also useful to think about what are the ways in which uh, people lose the sense of touch. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, for folks in your area, I don't have to introduce what used to be called the Rehab Institute of Chicago. At least that's what it was called when this image was taken. Now, of course, it's the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Uh, but one, you know, very clear example of a, a case, an application where people lose the sense of touch is where they actually lose a limb. So the mechanoreceptors are gone because the limb is gone. And so, of course, one of the challenges, how do you provide haptic or touch feedback in a scenario when uh, the limb is physically gone and, of course, through uh, reintervation surgery and wearable haptic devices developed at Northwestern and other places, uh, you, know, you can provide stimulus that replaces such a limb. There's other scenarios that are outlined on the, on the right of the slide, including uh, demining, in space and an area that I've worked in a lot, which is robot assisted surgery. Uh, but I will say that all of these are kind of very specialized professions where you lose the sense of touch and you lose the ability to manipulate. Uh, and there are really, of course, uh, you know, advanced technologies and great work in haptics and telerobotics over many years have solved a lot of the fundamental problems. Uh, but the question I have now is how do we translate some of these ideas from these specialized professions where it's permissible to have a very high cost fancy system um, into something that's more of a consumer application. So on the lower right, if you are you know, reaching out into a virtual environment and grabbing things as, as we become more and more uh, adept at creating really compelling immersive visual environments, it becomes especially disappointing when you reach out to grab something and you don't feel anything but your own fingertips. So in order to make uh, these sorts of interactions more ubiquitous, make them uh, going in the direction of things that could be consumer products, uh, we've been really interested in how do you, I'm gonna skip that slide, how, how do you go away from these traditional kinesthetic or force feedback haptic devices and, and move into wearable cutaneous or tactile haptic devices. 
So anyone who's worked in haptics should be familiar with uh, the famous Phantom Premium from several decades ago, which really opened the door to creating amazingly compelling virtual environments where you would feel net forces from solid or soft or any sort of object you wanted to program. And uh, like I said, these, uh, these devices were extremely compelling, but uh, you know, on the order of, of 10 to $30,000 for a really high quality interaction. Um, and simultaneously, or even earlier than that, um, the role of cutaneous sensing, so mechanoreceptors embedded in the skin, uh, their importance was being highlighted in the, the neuroscience and psychology community. So in these um, old videos, I think from the late 70s, early 80s, um, you see someone doing a very simple task, which is lighting a match, and they do it really quickly. Um, and then they go through an, an anesthetization uh, uh, procedure where they only lose mechanoreception sort of on the, on the fingertips. Uh, they still have fill, full visual ability. Uh, they still have all this dexterity. They can even feel forces because a lot of the forces are coming from uh, tendons and muscles and other parts of the hand. But all they have lost is this cutaneous uh, skin-based uh, mechanoreception in the fingertips uh, due to the anesthesia. And you can see how difficult it is for this participant to do something as simple as light a match. And for those of you who are more on the, on the robotic side than the haptics, uh, haptic interfaces side, of course, this really highlights the difficulty for creating smart robots that can interact physically and dexterously with their environment. Uh, because if you don't have this local tactile sensing, you don't know anything about local contact conditions, which are occluded from vision, uh, it becomes very difficult to do even a very simple manipulation task. So this importance of cutaneous feedback um, is you know, well known in our field right now. Uh, but then we can ask a, a question on the flip side, which is how do we then uh, create haptic devices that can stimulate the cutaneous sense? And of course, this is also something that's been worked on in haptics for a long time. And in the field, people really are using their knowledge of the different mechanoreceptors embedded in the skin to decide uh, what kind of stimulation to provide. So depending if you have the glabrous or non-hairy skin of the hand or the hairy skin on the back of the hand and most of the rest of the body, uh, you're gonna get different types of mechanoreceptors. And these different mechanoreceptors have different densities or spatial distributions and receptive fields. And they also respond to different frequencies. So one of the reasons vibration feedback is awesome and why we have it in our phones and I have it in my smartwatch here uh, is because they typically vibrate at frequencies where the Pacinian corpuscles go nuts. The Pacinian corpuscles are relatively deep in the skin. They respond to high frequency vibrations and uh, they have very large receptive fields and it's an extremely noticeable sensation. And so providing vibration feedback is easy from the perspective of, oh yeah, people will notice it. Human perception is, is you know, can, can easily be highlighted here. Uh, and in addition, on the engineering side, it's relatively easy and cheap to have actuators that produce vibrations. You can have eccentric mass motors, you can have linear resonant arrays, and uh, they take relatively little power compared to other types of actuators. So that's why so many devices are vibration feedback. But of course, we know that usually these vibration feedback devices are designed to call your attention to the stimulus and not always communicate detailed information. And so when you wanna start communicating more information, have a uh, more higher information rate transfer, then you wanna think about how do you stimulate these other types of mechanoreceptors? And also keeping in mind, it's not just about uh, transmitting information, but doing so in a way that doesn't have to be learned, right? And you want it to be ideally very natural and intuitive. So let's flip over now to what, yeah, you know, what can haptic device designs look like that um, exploit cutaneous mechanoreceptors? And I'm gonna start on something that is more on the kinesthetic side, uh, but it combines cutaneous and, and kinesthetic feedback um, and is also extremely literal in, in what we've decided is not really a great way. And that's this idea of active surfaces. 
Right? So if you think about it, everything that we do in haptic feedback um, typically is in uh, an illusion, right? We want people to think they're touching real objects, but they're touching um, you know, nothing except for a, a device. In this case, uh, with these active surfaces, you try to create a device that uh, basically recreates the real object. Rather than recreating the stimulus, you recreate the object. And this is probably one of the first instances of, of my lab you know, connecting to soft robotics, uh, because as we looked at the, the literature and different clever ways that people were creating these active surfaces, we realized that combination of stretchable materials and pneumatics, both vacuum and positive pressure, could be used in interesting combinations in order to make these kinds of controllable digital clays, which would change their shape and their mechanical properties. So in this video here that's repeating, uh, this was from, from quite a while ago, um, you have this uh, uh, set of cells and each cell is filled with coffee grounds. And then we vacuum the air out of the cell in order to jam the coffee grounds together. And it's through this particle jamming that you can generate uh, materials that effectively have changing stiffness. And then through some complicated other mechanisms for pneumatic control, you can change the shape and actuate different cells. So, so this, this was, was fun and it was an interesting way in this case to provide some uh, a methodology for uh, a palpation training in, in medicine. Uh, but ultimately, it's not the way we want to design haptic devices because it takes it way too literally. It's like, let's create the world in order to have this correct combination of cutaneous and, and, and kinesthetic feedback. Uh, but it's just too, too complicated to scale up and it doesn't take advantage of what we know about haptic illusions. So um, let's go like flip all the way over to the, to the simpler side and you know, I was sort of uh, uh, being negative about vibrations earlier as a form of feedback and saying, well, they uh, focus on, on calling your attention for events. Uh, but it turns out that you can use vibrations in more clever ways. Um, and one of those ways is to create asymmetric vibrations. So instead of using an eccentric mass motor that would essentially create a sinusoidal output, uh, if you have a very controllable uh, vibration actuator like these, these voice coil motors here, you can create waveforms that essentially give asymmetric pulses so you get pushed harder in one direction and then you don't notice the recovery. And the video can't really properly convey how it feels, uh, but I can just describe in words that it, it feels like a pulsing sensation where you're being pulled in a particular direction. The other thing that you can't really communicate from the, from the video is that uh, some people, and it depends on how well the illusion holds, they not only do they feel like they're pulled in a particular direction, but they feel compelled to move in a particular direction. And this is an effect that we don't, we don't fully understand, um, but this being compelled to move by these vibration signals has been demonstrated in, uh, in, in many papers, and that's something we'd, we'd like to further exploit. So, so there may be hope for vibrations after all for communicating much more sophisticated information than I originally gave them credit for. So let's go a little bit more deep into vibrations and then we'll, we'll uh, step back and, and look at other types of stimulation. So the last thing I wanna say about vibrations, um, and this is not so much as it has a haptic interface, but I know there are a number of uh, folks in Northwestern interested in rehab. So I wanted to mention the role of vibration in providing passive tactile stimulation for, uh, for motor, motor and sensory recover, recovery of certain deficits. And so what we've been looking at is using passive tactile stimulation in the form of vibrations in a wearable device uh, to try to improve spasticity and poor, poor muscle tone for patients after stroke. And we are, thank goodness, after recovery from not being able to study patients at the outset of the COVID pandemic, we're now about two thirds of the way through a pretty deep clinical study where we have subjects take home these vibrating gloves 
which uh, provide passive vibrotactile stimulation for several hours a day, and subjects wear these for eight weeks. And while our current clinical trial is not done, we have some preliminary data showing that there are improvements um, in uh, a modified Ashworth scale, which is a measure of spasticity after uh, this eight week intervention. Uh, and in this uh, pilot study, we found that this passive tactile stimulation compared to control uh, here, like a positive number is a good change in, in spasticity for the patient. Uh, so we saw a lot of promise that caused us to invest in a, in a longer term clinical trial uh, with more subjects, which we are doing right now. Um, however, like why this works is also something we don't fully understand. So we're simultaneously uh, running some clinical trials to try to test this, which is why does vibration uh, actually improve, uh, yeah, improve spasticity? So it may re regulate electrophysiology. Um, it might also change excitability of motor systems. Uh, and uh, these are all things we're exploring. We don't have answers yet, but uh, there's really some exciting directions to use vibration feedback in rehab, which compared to traditional rehab robotics, if it works as well, could be an improvement because it really could be more of a wearable take-home device. And it could even be used in patients that don't have any ability to move initially. So let's jump off from vibrations and now look to more sophisticated types of, of stimulus into the fingertip. Um, and this work is a, is a few years old now, but it's a great jumping off point because it uh, is easy to visualize the way in which deforming the skin can provide a really compelling form of haptic feedback even if it's not based on feedback from a world grounded force. So remember traditional haptic devices like the Phantom Premium, they're like robots that sit on your desktop and they push on your hand relative to ground. And given the importance of cutaneous feedback, um, we and other researchers like Domenico Pratichizzo, who calls this sensory subtraction, looked at what if you don't provide any world grounded kinesthetic feedback, but you just provide the type of skin deformation that would occur if you were to manipulate the object. And it turns out this is super compelling. You, you go and you grasp a virtual object like my former student Sam is doing in the video. And when you pick up the virtual object, you don't feel any you know, overall weight pulling down on your hand, but you feel the skin stretch that would correspond to that weight. And uh, especially for, for light weights and the light forces with which we normally manipulate objects, most of the feedback we get really is through this cutaneous mechanism and not through uh, muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs that are, are located at other locations in the arm. And uh, so this was pretty cool. We found how compelling this was. And um, one of the things we realized in doing this research is we, we had to find a way to show that um, it's not just about measuring just noticeable difference and, and using a lot of the typical parameters that we use to describe performance of haptic devices, but trying to show that people naturally believed that they were feeling what they wanted them to believe. So instead of doing a classic experiment where we would say, here's two masses, which one is heavier or lighter, uh, in which case the subjects are kind of primed to say, oh yeah, those, I, what I'm supposed to be feeling is mass. Instead, we didn't tell them what they were feeling. We said, there's a, a red block and a green block and they're different. Why don't you pick them up and play with them and tell us how they're different in a kind of open response paradigm. So for example, we might change the mass, we might change the stiffness, we might change the friction coefficient between the blocks, but we wouldn't tell the subjects um, you know, anything about this. We would have them play with the blocks and tell us what is different about the two. And uh, the thickness of the lines in this uh, very qualitative plot on the right indicates how many people mapped what we really changed in terms of the, the virtual physical parameter versus what they thought had changed. And uh, interestingly, people did really well for mass and friction and for stiffness, it was a little bit more confusing because in terms of stiffness, we do think that people probably expected to feel kinesthetic forces within the hand that push their fingers apart. Um, and then also uh, stiffness can be easily confused with these other parameters because if something has 
uh, say less stiffness, you would probably have to squeeze harder to get enough friction in order to lift the mass. And uh, so sometimes the stiffness was sort of mixed up with, with changes in friction and mass, but it turns out we found in the literature that people do that with real objects as well, not just our virtual objects. So I guess some of the same kind of haptic errors and illusions that would occur with real objects also occurred uh, with this type of fingertip skin deformation device. So this project got us very excited about using skin deformation as a way to communicate in pretty sophisticated types of information like the mechanical properties of objects. But we also wanted to communicate other types of information, uh, for example, in navigation. So a former student, uh, Yu Hong, uh, was interested in using skin deformation uh, in a holdable device to guide people to walk in different directions. And uh, as, as a haptic device, there's nothing super new or special about it. Uh, but one of the things we found interesting was that people responded differently to the haptic feedback they received. So if uh, this shows a plot here of um, the angle uh, in radians of, of where we were directing the user and then the response is where they thought we were directing them uh, and where they then walked based on our direction. And it turns out it's not really a straight line. There's some variability between users, but in general, um, there is kind of like this nonlinear curve. And so we learned human responses to haptic cues based on people's responses. And we also showed it just wasn't their tendency to walk in certain ways, because if we gave them audio feedback about which direction to walk, they would, they would do it straight on. So then we took what we learned and we use this haptic device to steer people in different directions. So the left shows what happened when we had just a naive uh, algorithm. That is, we just push subjects in the direction that we thought they should be pushed in order to walk from a starting point to one of these gray targets. Uh, and these are um, on the order of meters here. So uh, you know we could do an okay job of steering them, but you can see a lot of overshoot. Um, however, when we optimized our feedback based on our learned models of how people respond, we could do a much better job of steering them. And then we also thought maybe we don't wanna be pushing at people all the time. We don't always wanna be um, tugging at their skin. So we implemented an as needed algorithm where we said, okay, um, only when it looks like you're starting to veer off do we provide you a new feedback. And you can see that it didn't work as well as the optimized when we're always giving them feedback, but it is better than just the naive approach. Uh, and you know, we're able to show that with different subjects, we can get them to walk to targets based on this fingertip skin deformation. So it's another type, another different type of communication of information that you can give. So when this worked in the plane for, for helping people walk around, uh, we actually had some collaborators who were interested in, could you start to help guide teaching people to make surgical movements? And they were interested now in moving the hand in multiple degrees of freedom, and of course, not just in the plane. And so my former student, Julie Walker, built uh, this device, which has a skin deformation on the thumb and the forefinger, now also in a holdable format. Wearable is not always better than holdable. <laughs> There's definitely some, some cases where it's easier to, to fit and for the person to adjust uh, and use the device best if it's holdable. And that was definitely the case here. And we found that with these uh, two uh, uh, stimulus locations for the thumb and the index finger, we could uh, have them go relatively in different directions, like push in the same direction, push in opposite directions, which sort of created a sensation of a, of a torque. And we could get people to move in lots of different directions based on, based on this guidance. And uh, indeed, we have collaborators testing this out now as a way to give inputs for, for training surgical motions. And we, we do think that there's a good uh, motivation to use this cutaneous stimulation because if you want someone to move along a certain path and you use grounded force feedback to drag them that way, they're not using their own motor effort in order to create the movement. Uh, so in this case, what we do is we have the person use their own motor effort and we give them a very intuitive feedback about which direction they should be going. Hey, can I ask a quick so, question? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Are you um, 
are you actually, so the paths, are you actually providing sort of the same amount of accuracy everywhere along the path? Like, I think usually when I think about navigating, I'm gonna be a little bit sloppy at the beginning and I'm only gonna be uh, sort of fine tuned and get more accurate when I get closer to the place I'm trying to grab or trying mm -hmm. to get to. And uh, I was wondering if you're, you know, are you a kind of being judicious about how much correction to supply based on how far you are from the target? Yeah, great, great question. So um, in these cases, generally no, except for I would say this as needed case. Uh, so so we we're just trying to provide haptic feedback based on the current direction we think a person should be going and, and not actually in terms of their reaching the target. But that tends to naturally happen when we provide feedback on an as needed basis, because as they come closer to the target, uh, small errors in heading result in you know, larger corrections. So it, it does happen naturally in, uh, in some of these cases, but it's not like the device control was specifically designed for that. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so um, I think I'll, I'll end this section on something that's not really wearable haptics, but it's something close to my heart. So I wanted to mention it anyways. Uh, and that is using haptics in education. Uh, and so while, and we do think that we would like to have wearable devices, uh, and, and that is a path that my former PhD student who did much of this work, Melissa Orta Martinez, she's now in the faculty at CMU, that, that she's looking at. But the precursor to this were uh, grounded haptic devices that, for example, could display virtual springs for a physics lesson. Uh, ways of kind of making haptic Legos to put the devices together in different ways in order to create two degree of freedom devices, and also ways of doing math learning with tactile devices that can be rearranged in different patterns um, in order to communicate different types of math lessons. Uh, so these are going towards lower cost solutions for educational applications. Um, and that's been important to us in terms of making these more into to products that, that everyday people can use. And actually, if anybody's interested in uh, seeing more about these devices or how to make them or how to download the designs, uh, HAPKIT, H-A-P-K-I-T dot Stanford dot E-D-U is, is the website where all these designs can be, can be obtained. So... Let's uh, shift gears to kind of the last half of my talk or less than half, uh, last third, I guess, on what we wanna do in terms of wearable haptic applications. So I mentioned some of these different applications earlier, uh, but I sort of glossed over the human human part, which is very much about social interactions. And uh, so I'm gonna talk about social interactions in just a minute, but also say a little bit more now about going away from the fingertips, which is where um, the, the skin deformation devices focused earlier and going on to other parts of the body. Uh, so the challenges there are that the, there's much higher density of mechanoreceptors on the hand than there are on the hairy skin and other parts of the body. And then another challenge I want to bring up, not, not that we've you know, fully solved it, but something we really still have to consider as we design these devices, is that the hands are really designed for active touch. If we want to learn about, say, the texture of a, our surface, uh, a surface, we would use active exploration and exploratory procedures that have been well documented in order to kind of properly stimulate the mechanoreceptors to get the information we need about those objects. Now, if you go to a wearable device that's not on a fingertip, but it's on another part of the body, um, you know, typically we experience this more as passive touch, right? Like touch will come to us and we're not used to sort of controlling our bodies in a way to explore the world to get feedback in these locations. And so when you think about interactive haptic devices or a kind of social touch scenario where someone might just be sending you like a haptic emoji, uh, this information comes in, but it's not something that you initiated. It becomes passive. We do think it's, it's harder to understand and uh, we need to figure out what is the right way to, to cue people or prime people for that. Um, so in exploring other parts of the body, uh, we've done this in a few different domains. So the first one I'm gonna talk about actually in the context of brain computer interfaces. So I had a former PhD student, Daryl Dio, who was working closely with folks in the Department of Neurosurgery, 
who were part of this brain gate project, uh, which I'll describe in a minute. And one of the first things that he had to do when working with a patient who had spinal cord injury and very little sensation from uh, the neck down was to look at, wow, if we're gonna provide haptic feedback to a spinal cord injury patient who has a brain computer interface, uh, where are we going to provide that? Um, and this is separate from the idea of actually using the BCI itself to provide the feedback, which is really fascinating, but a whole other area of challenging research. But here, um, you know, similar to the, the work done um, at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab many years ago, like we need to find a different location of the body to provide haptic feedback where there's actually still sensation. Uh, so in this case, we tested a, a patient and found that sensation was really still good um, at the C5 uh, vertebra and above. And uh, so we looked at how would we design peripheral haptic feedback for uh, invasive BCI control. So we worked with a participant who has uh, one of these Utah electrode arrays planted in the brain, which records a neural activity, um, worked on in Krishna Shinoi's lab to create a neural signal decoder, then creates a, a command signal that could be used to control, for example, a cursor or a robot or to type or whatever. And in our case, it was cursor control. But we also wanted to provide haptic feedback to see if it could be used simultaneously with BCI and also potentially enhance performance. And so here, uh, the haptic device we decided would actually push on the back of the subject's neck. And we were using a phantom premium, as you'll see in the video on the next slide, uh, but it could potentially be a wearable device as well. It doesn't have to be world grounded. So we had lots of scientific questions here that I won't have time to get into details, but uh, quickly we found that uh, we could get responses in motor cortex and we could actually measure these with the same uh, BCI device. Uh, we could provide haptic stimulation um, as feedback during IBC BCI control and it still worked. It did not interfere with performance. So here's a picture of a participant who is using the BCI to uh, do motor imagery, to think about targets, and then the cursor was being moved to those targets. And what we did is we provided haptic feedback that indicated the motion of the cursor uh, such that um, it, the, the user is not only relying on visual feedback in order to be able to do this task. And so we would have the stimulus go in different directions. We would record from the BCI. And we found that uh, the accuracy and the perception just using the haptic feedback was actually pretty much the same and even a little bit better than how accurate we were at doing the neural decoding uh, in terms of which direction they, they wanted to go. So it shows that the haptic feedback actually is a good match for these kinds of tasks. Um, oops, I thought I had another slide on this, but yeah, so the takeaways here, um, and this is really just scratching the surface of this area, uh, that that haptic feedback can be used in conjunction with brain computer interfaces and uh, moving away from the fingertips uh, or the hands even, you know, we did find that the back of the neck was a suitable location to provide feedback in this very specialized population. But going on to other ways of moving away from the fingertips that would be more of use to everyday people, we can think about putting haptic stimulation devices onto the arm and the wrist. Uh, so uh, without dwelling on all the details of the results, uh, the main point is just like with these wearable fingertip devices, we could provide haptic feedback with simple wearable devices on the arm and have people manipulate objects and they could still identify these properties like mass and stiffness and friction. Uh, so we thought this, this is pretty cool, even though the haptic feedback is no longer co-located with the fingers that is doing the manipulation, subjects could still do this haptic exploratory procedure and, and figure out the mechanical properties by integrating information from the wrist with, uh, with their own movements of the fingertips and the behavior of the virtual objects. Uh, so this is promising. And this kind of has launched in my lab a lot of creativity and thinking about how do we build wearable haptic devices that aren't quite as clunky as the ones that are shown in the previous slide. 
And uh, these are some of our, our earlier efforts. Uh, the one on the left using a kind of traditional soft robotic haptic mechanism uh, where you have these uh, fiber reinforced elastomeric actuators, uh, enclosed actuators, also known as freeze, F-R-E-E's, uh, and putting those in combination. So you have a single point contact that pushes on the skin in multiple directions. Um, and then in this other example on the right, we have um, what could have been a whole different talk. We have these soft growing vine-like robots and we created one that many people think is creepy, but it's basically a bracelet, which then uh, from it emerges this soft growing robot that grows around the arm. And in the process, sort of delivers little pouch motors in different locations that can stimulate the skin. And so you can both uh, sort of squeeze the arm as well as have pouches underneath that make contacts. And we've been experimenting with this whole array of, you know, how many points of contact, how many directions at each point, and uh, trying to understand the pros and cons of this, especially when we are trying to make soft wearable de designs. Um, and there's just a couple more, a couple more designs, and I think I won't talk too much about them, but I'll note that the video on the right is something we, we just submitted uh, at the beginning of this week to a conference where, uh, now I'm back to the fingertip again, but we also think this could be used at the wrist. Uh, this one on the right here is actually a monolithic, fully 3D printed uh, soft haptic device using a semi-soft materials with vacuum actuation we can get four degrees of freedom of stimulation on the fingertip. And you know, we can pr print, uh, at least on the size of a build plate of a Formlabs 3D printer, we can print four of these at once. Um, of course, the dirty secret in all of these pneumatic type soft haptic devices, maybe not so secret as you can see all the cables going off screen, is that you need an air source. Uh, there has been some really nice work about how do you exchange air in a device that's maybe not, uh, that maybe could be wearable, but, but not you know, wearable on the fingertip that can actually do that. Uh, but these are, are open questions for whether pneumatic haptic devices that are wearable are really going to be practical uh, in the long term. So the last thing I wanna talk about is uh, some exciting work in social touch. Uh, over the recent years, there's been a lot of interest in how people communicate social emotional cues through the sense of touch. This is me stroking my, my husband's arm, doing a very common social touch, which is thought to excite a relatively newly found mechanoreceptor called the CT afferent, which uh, responds to stroking motions and that makes people feel good. So uh, my former postdoc, now faculty at USC, Heather Culbertson, uh, figured out that you could actually create a discrete array, like very discrete centimeters apart stimulus out of voice coil actuators. And that if you got the timing just right, it would feel like a continuous pleasant sensation. And we don't know if it's actually activating these same CT afferent mechanoreceptors, but people pretty universally feel like if we get the pattern right, um, that it does feel, feel continuous and pleasant. So it feels like a stroke rather than a series of individual indentations. And this is the kind of haptic illusion I'm talking about when we say that we don't wanna recreate the physical world. Like I could have a robot come up to you and drag its finger along your arm and that could obviously create the sensation of, a, of this stroke, uh, but that's not really a wearable solution. Um, Maybe our current device still has some work to do to make it anything like a consumer product, uh, but nonetheless, it's super promising that these discrete contacts can feel continuous and pleasant. We thought maybe we should try some other things to create these continuous and pleasant sensations, like this one on the lower left, where uh, we have multiple contacts uh, and they each contact would actually slide on the skin in addition to just indenting. But it turns out that's not needed. It doesn't really feel that much better than uh, the just discrete indentations, uh, but it is important to get the timing right. And I think I won't spend the time to get into it. So we have plenty of time for questions. So where do we go with this idea that you could create these strokes? Well, we decided we wanted to look at lots of different types of social touches. And although there was some documentation on the liter in the literature about what kind of social touches people used, 
no one had actually recorded them before. So here we have my student Sophia wearing a capacitive tactile array sensor sleeve on her arm. Uh, my student Mike is touching the arm and uh, what we asked our subjects to do who were in various pairs of, of uh, people who knew each other well uh, to communicate emotions through touch like pay attention to me, uh, communicating love, communicating happiness or excitement. And we recorded all of these on this tactile array. And so we got a bunch of patterns of how people perform special touches. And then although we made measurements on the whole arm, we mapped these onto behaviors that could be implemented by a set of only eight tactors uh, using the same mechanism I showed earlier. And uh, this is in an, an in-press paper. So we're, we're finalizing the, the manuscript for posting, um, although actually I think it's on archive already, uh, where we've shown that people map both arousal and valence kind of appropriately for the different types of social cues, um, and that people do a pretty good job of recognizing the social cues. So it, it turns out that if, if you are given social cues from one of these tactile arrays, uh, you recognize them at about the same rate as you would recognize tactile cues from a human stranger. People do better if you're getting a tactile cue from a human that you know well, like a, a friend or someone you're in a romantic relationship with. Uh, people do recognize at higher rates, but it turns out our device is as good as a stranger, uh, which actually seems quite reasonable. I, uh, wouldn't want to think that the device would be really any better than a stranger. So the, the last project that I'll mention um, as we think about kind of the, the social role of haptics is uh, sort of combines some of the social cues issues with this idea of the information rate, the rate of information transfer. Um, so one of the things we've been thinking about is that uh, on the arm, we have poor mechanoreception, but it's a good place to mount haptic devices because they don't get in the way when you wanna use your hands. Uh, so for example, you know, my watch has haptic feedback and sort of easy to get haptic feedback there because it doesn't get in the way of other things and I already have a watch there. Uh, but at the same time, we can get a lot more information when we use our fingertips. So uh, my recently graduated student, Sophia Williams, uh, had this thought that, well, what if we got the best of both worlds? Uh, what if we had an arm mounted haptic device that could give us some information, but if we wanted higher quality, more detailed information, you could reach over with your other hand and touch it and then get you know, more information throughput through your fingers. So let's say I'm giving a talk to you all and somebody's calling me, my hands could be under my desk here. I could be getting a signal that, oh, I wanna pay more attention to that so that I would reach over with my other hand and get that more information and, and you all would be none the wiser. So there's kind of this idea of communicating salient information, but in a, in a very private fashion. And basically what Sophia showed was that um, you could, uh, be, do this by um, understanding that if you have the fingertips and forearm feedback together, uh, that you the fact you're getting feedback in two locations doesn't degrade the amount of information you can get from the fingertips. Um, and she also had some sort of examples of kind of real world use scenarios of, of how you might build this into, into a really usable device. All right, with, with that, um, I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, these various examples of projects on ubiquitous wearable haptic devices. And I wanna thank again, all the students who contributed and our collaborators and sponsors. And I would be happy now to answer some questions. Thanks very much, Allison, that was great. Um, Questions, I'm gonna hand you the microphone so Allison can hear you. Welcome. Uh, thanks for the talk. I'm, I'm curious about, um, since you talked a little bit about information rate uh, on the haptic channel, I know um, in vision, it's been quantified per retina at around six megabits per second. I wonder, 
how far you are in, in the haptic world in terms of understanding what is the, the max bit rate given you know, this platoon of different receptors with different response profiles. Do you have any estimate of that currently? Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't know the exact number, but I guarantee you it is orders of magnitude <laughs> lower. Um, the, uh, you know, the person that would probably know that the best is uh, Hong Tan, uh, formerly at Purdue. I think she has moved on to industry. Uh, but she and, and others have, have done more to quantify the, the sort of the bit rate. Uh, but in addition, the, her and some other researchers and specifically sponsored in a, a, a speech to touch transfer kind of applications. So creating phonemes and such through patterns of haptic stimulation. And uh, they, they did show that you could basically recreate speech, which I thought was amazing, uh, through I think 33 different tactors, uh, but it is much slower. And, and so the rate I would say has gotta be orders of magnitude less. Thanks. Other questions? There's one down in front. Down there, okay. <laughs> From my viewpoint, I can see it. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I just have a question on the sort of tests that are being done. It seemed like all the examples you showed were basically you bring someone in and for an hour they play around with the haptic device. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, if I'm reading, right, it took me years to learn how to read. Uh, and so I'm just wondering what sort of stuff do you think you're missing out on by not running these sort of tests for years at a time? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, just maybe first to, to push back and not exactly answer your question. We do feel like in, in technology design, at least for, yeah, you know, for healthy people who don't absolutely need it, it, it does need to be pretty immediately, um, you know, effective and obvious, and it shouldn't require a long time for learning. Um, in terms of more sort of intermediate time frames, maybe months, not years, um, there's some really nice evidence that like passive tactile learning can be very effective. Uh, my postdoc, Caitlin Syme, did some of this in her PhD at Georgia Tech, and uh, folks like, oh, I can't think of the name now, but yeah, there are other folks like who have like tactile vests where you're going from, um, from vision or, or sound to, to touch, and they show that over, you know, weeks and months, people can learn that. And so I think we do know that environment, in environments where you have you know, highly motivated participants who are, are willing to take that time, that, that you can have amazing tactile learning. And it, it's not like they're necessarily going to learn more than the limitations of information throughput that we just discussed, uh, but that you don't have to have intuitive and natural feedback. It, you know, it, it can be somewhat unnatural and people will learn it. We just haven't really been focused on that because I, I think the argument will be made for, for technology that people will adopt. Um, it should be sort of immediately obvious how to use it. Thank you. Thanks. I, I have a quick question about the, the passive tactile stimulation device. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite get how that worked and what made it passive. Um, I wonder if you could just say again what, what the device is or how it works and... Uh... Yeah, <laughs> sure, this one, right? Yep. Yeah, so I guess it, it's passive in the sense that uh, it's, it's not controlled by anything that the user is doing. Uh, the person passively receives that stimulus. So uh, basically it's a, it's a glove and we have, there's actually new, new designs that we have which are more appropriate for donning and doffing by, by people with limited movement. Uh, but it just has uh, multiple uh, ERM type actuators at locations on the hand and they, they simply vibrate in different patterns. And we don't know if there's any way to optimize those at the moment. We're just trying to provide lots of different types of tactile stimuli in order to kind of throw the kitchen sink at it and, and see if that has an effect on, on basically movement and sensory recovery. 
Uh, so the device is, is very simple and the passive part just means that the, the human doesn't have to do anything. We, we ask that they stay awake while they're using it because we, we think that might be important, uh, but they, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not changing based on their movement or behavior. And so, so the subjects put it on for a period of time and then take it off and that's, that's how it works? That's right, yep. Right. Thank you. Question up here? I have a, a soft robotics question. Are you sure. uh, open loop controlling the tactors or do you have the ability to measure like a uh, close of force feedback loop or position feedback loop? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've been doing all this open loop um, kind of in the style of traditional kinesthetic uh, haptic feedback devices where uh, you know, you provide a current and if you have a decent motor, then, you know, you have an idea of how much force it's applying. Uh, I totally agree that some of these devices may require for more precise stimulus a uh, you know some kind of feedback mechanism in order to create you know, specific changes in position or force. Uh, but for the moment, they've been operating in, in open loop. By the way, if there's a question online, uh, people who are watching oh. via Zoom, feel free to type it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll try to get to you. And I think there's another question somewhere. Uh, here, here we go. Uh, th uh, thank you for the talk. I was curious about the results you showed for transitioning from fingertip to wrist for the virtual mm -hmm. cubes picking up. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you indicate so transition the stimuli from the fingertips to the wrist and whether or not you saw similar sort of qualitative relationships between changing mass, friction, um, and whether or not participants picked up on that, similar to how you described for the fingertip uh, stimuli? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so let's see, so for the fingertip, um, you know, if anyone's familiar with using uh, Chi 3D, or Chi 3D or any of these uh, simulation environments, right? They'll, they'll say, okay, your fingers interacted with the object and, and given the current state, apply this force. And when we use the fingertip haptic device, depending on which device it was, we would just you know, apply that as a vector of force, or we might control the position to attempt to stretch the skin to generate that force using a simple model of the skin stiffness. Um, what we've done with, with the wrist devices is we haven't used all of those degrees of freedom, but rather we've looked at just one degree of freedom and kind of done one at a time, right? So uh, if in, in feeling a mass, uh, the direction that's most important is up down, we would provide just a single degree of freedom push controlled into the skin that would correspond to the amount of force that, that the person should be feeling in that one degree of freedom. And then the same thing for stiffness, which would be like horizontally and, and friction, which would be horizontal. Uh, so in that case, we were just mapping onto a single degree of freedom, but being able to show that people could uh, distinguish which uh, mechanical properties had changed between pairs of objects. So it's fairly coarse in that we're just saying, yeah, you know, can you tell which mechanical property is different between these two objects? And they would do the exploratory procedure and they, you know, would have a, a similarly correct guess to when we had the fingertip devices. Uh, but we do think it's probably going to be slower uh, and we haven't yet explored, uh, although we have some preliminary devices to, to do that now, we haven't fully explored what happens if you try to provide all the different degrees of freedom in a single contact, which which might be more natural, but that might be might be harder to map and understand. I hope that answers. Yeah, I think your question. we have one more. Yes, we have uh, time for one more question, and I see one online there. I don't know, Mark. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask it, or would you like me to ask it for you? Oh, ha happy to ask it. Thank you, Larry. Just History. interested in the. You, you mapped out your work in the medical, you know, medical mm -hmm. robotics. The obvious uh, broader use application is in so-called skills training simulators in heavy equipment, all manner of different kinds of skills. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, lends itself to remote skills training, which is of particular interest to me. I'm just curious if you've 
thinking about extending that with some partners that are non-medical and what you thought about that, that domain. It's uh, yeah, that's that's a great question, and I'm really glad that you're working in that area because that's that's not something we've done in our lab. Um, Ken Salisbury, who's here, just went emeritus, but he's in the computer science department. Um, actually, had been looking at uh, you know training for machine shop type activities uh, with with haptic feedback. So I completely agree that that's important, and it, it's also sort of interesting. I feel like. 20 years ago, there was a ton of interest in like sponsorship for research, particularly in medical simulation. And now I think there's a lot more interest in, interest in these other types of skills training. Uh, and that's also been, I would say, emphasized with uh, the Oculus Rift and other various uh, VR and augmented reality technologies. So I, I think we are interested in particular how can haptic feedback be integrated with augmented reality and what's the right way to augment things that you feel in the real world with additional haptic feedback that you maybe get on your wrist. Uh, and that might be applicable to some of the ways in which people are thinking about doing um, more broad skills training, but just barely scratching the surface there. That's very helpful. Yeah, you anticipated my next question, which is the integration with AR, yeah. not VR, but a AR is the... I think yeah. there'll be a lot more sponsorship opportunities coming up in that in that space. <laughs> thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a full slate of meetings for Allison coming up, so we're going to have to <laughs> bring this to an end. But uh, please join me in thanking Allison one more time. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>